Hello everyone, my name is Fox. In this video, we're going to be going over a how-to on how to fix the refresh rate problem on the GPD Win 4. There is a mediation uh, that we can do with software using CRU or custom resolution utility. Shout out to GCAT for going through all of the trouble there and iterating through every step, going through every little setting to find something that could passively fit inside of what the IC was doing. There is a rotation that is happening to the panel base screen so that it presents itself to the system itself, to every operating system, that it is a landscape panel. This solves a lot of problems for us because on portrait-based displays, uh, pretty much every other handheld that has come out prior, except the GPD Win Max 2, which does have a native landscape display. Uh, what we're trying to solve here is a lot of older games, DirectX 8 and DirectDraw types of games. These games will fail without having to use some type of a tool to fix this. So with this type of fix that GPD has done on this type of display, so it's a portrait-based panel, but they are correcting it via hardware, and the system thinks it's a landscape-based display. Ergo, there are no actual problems that we have with running old games. Everything just runs. There's nothing that a user needs to do. However, there was a problem that has been eventually found out. It's gone through a lot of different people, and no one really picked up on it. You could kind of see it, and I also blame myself a bit because when I was like looking at it intently, I thought it was uh, screen tearing happening in the landscape orientation, which was odd. So I kind of just chalked it up and I never really addressed it again. I did notice it, but every time that I would look at it, the issue would kind of go away. GPD said that this only affects 2D based games. That's not true. It affects everything. Uh, it's just that on 2D games, it's very apparent. And with 2D games, what you would look at, and I'll show you an example right here, this is Sonic Mania. Uh, what is happening here is that with high contrast and parallax backgrounds moving through it, you can see the judder happen. What's happening here, people are saying stutter, and this is a bit of a misnomer. What is actually happening is you are seeing a stale frame. So uh, the frames are being updated every 16.6 .6 milliseconds. It's a 60 hertz screen. And what you're seeing is one slice of a frame that is not getting updated. So you are seeing a previous frame staying on the screen before it gets updated and you get jumped up to the next frame over. What presents is a, is a shift, is a judder. So we're looking at a, a, it's a stale frame problem. So what the problem is, is that the IC that is doing the rotation to make it a landscape, uh, landscape panel, what is going on is that that's not keeping up. GPD has fixed this. However, it is a little bit more involved. It is still a very simple process. You will need a programmer and some DuPont wires, uh, and that's it. There's no soldering whatsoever involved, and I'll show you in this how-to video on how that actually works and operates. Uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to a few of the other people on the GPD Discord. Uh, Pell Run for actually doing this first. Uh, he was uh, pretty instrumental in kind of getting us up to speed and uh, getting the right drivers because the drivers that GPD had supplied were for a different programmer. Uh, and also the correct setting. So shout out to Pellrun for that. And then there's also E1000 who has done a bunch of documentation. There's already a V3. That's going to be in the description field below. And I would suggest as you're going through the how-to video in this video that you also reference that guide because it might be getting updated as well to kind of keep this video kind of up to date a bit because the general flow of what you're doing in this video will remain true. Uh, and maybe the documentation might reference other programmers. But right now there are a few programmers in there I am using this one that looks like this, has a little little flappy doodle lever. So that's the one that I'm using. So thank you very much to all the GPD Discord members that have been helping through this process. And I'm making this video just to show how actually easy it is. But I do want to address the, um, there's people that are confused about the native landscape display. And uh, the, the thing I want to comment about here, and again, not saying that this is something that we should sweep under the rug or, or discount or anything. The situation is not ideal. It sucks. But having said that, what GPD has done is in effect made the screen into a native landscape panel. In effect, everyone that has a GPD Win 4, every GPD Win 4 operates as if it is a landscape-based display. So if you play older PC games on there, it's just going to run. No one is going to have any issue with portrait-based displays that happens on other handhelds. That's not going to happen on the Win 4 because of what GPD is doing. The problem is the refresh rate. So I just want to make sure that this is clear. Uh, people are getting a little bit caught up in the whole native, the semantics of it. And the only reason that I bring that up is like, no one actually cared. Like, I'm, I'm not picking on I, I and Neo at this particular point. I just had it right here. Everyone does this. 
when you see the advertisements for these things, it says that it's a 1920 by 1080 display. That's actually false. It's technically a 1080 by 1920 display, but no one cares because effectively you play it like this and the screen is rotated from its portrait uh, orientation and you play it as 1920 by 1080. So what does it matter if for all intents and purposes, when you're playing a game to the system itself, it's OS agnostic. This is not like it's only going to run on Windows. This is Windows and Linux. Linux and Windows both think this is a landscape-based display. So for all intents and purposes, what does it matter if it's native or not? That is what the whole thing that I don't really get is, and there's a lot of people really hung up on that particular part of this. Um, what matters is the refresh rate problem. That is the actual problem, and that does suck. And in this video, we're going to fix it. So I'm going to show you how to fix that. So in this guide, you'll need the programmer chip linked in E1000's documentation and the DuPont wires also linked in E1000's guide. Let's get into the how-to on how to flash the IC of the display. First, you need to open your Win4. Remove all of the exterior screws. On the bottom of the Win4 is a plastic strip that you're going to have to remove as there are two more screws in here. With those other screws removed, you can now start prying the case open. You can optionally remove the one Wi-Fi antenna lead and lead for the back buttons, but I chose just to leave them connected. From here, you want to look at the three points next to the Wi-Fi chip, as this is the programming points we need to connect with the DuPont wires. Before going any further at this point, your Win4 should have been fully charged. You'll want to power your Win4 on and do Windows key plus R to bring up the run menu, type powercfg.cpl, and then make sure the display will never go to sleep on battery. We want to make sure the screen remains on. At this point, you're ready to start programming the IC. On another computer or laptop, make sure you open E1000's documentation, link in the description field below. On the computer or laptop that will be flashing the display, you'll first want to download the drivers and the application and hex for the programmer. This is listed in the documentation, but I'll also have the mega.nz link in the description field below. You'll want to download all three things inside this mega link. From there, you can go ahead and install the drivers even before you connect the device. Let it finish its install process. At this point, let's head back and look at the programmer itself. I've peeled off three of the mail-to-mail -mail DuPont wires. You'll want to stick them in ports 13, 14, and 15. Remember that there are 16 ports in total, so you'll want that last port open. We are now ready to begin flashing. I'm using a USB extension cable here just to make the filming process easier, so it's up to you if you want to use one or not. Back on your laptop or computer, go ahead and open the upgrade flash application. You'll get some warnings that it can't get the device. This is fine. Just make sure you see that the flashing program sees the flasher itself. It will say online at the bottom. At this point, click prog and point to the hex file you downloaded from the mega NZ link. You'll get another failure. This is fine. We just want to have the hex file preloaded and ready to program. At this point, it would be wise to double check the documentation from E1000 as the cable wires might be colored different. But as long as you follow the same process, you'll be fine. Even if you were to do it in the opposite order, just flip it around and try the flashing process again. How I did it was by putting my left arm around the Win4 and around my camera equipment. I used both of my hands to position the wires in place at a 45 degree angle and then just held firm with my left hand. I actually moved my hand a bit while it was flashing the first time and it failed and I just set it up again and flashed again. When it's connected properly, you'll see two progress bars fill up and see two success messages. At this point, the hard part is done. Go ahead and close up your Win4 and reboot your machine. When your Win4 powers back up again, open up CRU or Custom Resolution Utility, double click on Reset All, and then double click on Restart 64. From there, go ahead and open CRU itself and you should see 60 Hz and 45 Hz listed. At this point, you've verified that the settings are correct. GCAT also created a 40 Hz mode for GCAT also created a 40 Hz mode that works after the flash as well, and it's in the documentation. From here, we can clearly see the before and after is working perfectly. Before we flash, you should be able to clearly see the momentary pauses on the screen, but afterwards, it's nice, clean, and smooth. All right, so that's the end of the video. Hopefully, the how-to showed you how simple this whole process was. I, I know that a lot of people think that, you know, when they first heard solder as well, this, like, 
made it very few people that wanted to actually entertain this. But this is a solderless solution. You just literally press on the points that are already exposed in an open area that's easy to get to with only opening up the back shell. And it's a very forgiving process. Like I mentioned in the how-to, my hand just moved just a little bit and the flashing process failed. And I just had to run the flashing process again. You just keep on running it until you get success matches, messages and then you're good. This whole process is something that is kind of like uh, if you're the people that buy a brand new cars and then they wind up having recalls for you know different safety things later on and then you have to go back to the dealership and waste your day by going there for them to fix it. And this is how I kind of see the same situation. Yeah, the situation sucks. It should have been picked up early on, but a lot of people missed it. And it's easy to miss if you're playing certain games and you can attribute it to other things. I still blame myself for not being a little bit more hard on it myself. Uh, but thankfully, GBD has fixed it. And the situation to fix it is actually really simple. So I hope you actually entertain uh, fixing yourself because it is pretty simple. That's it for this video. As always, guys, thank you for your time. And thanks for watching.